as God would have it, we are in Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. Go ahead and join me standing as, we, as I read from God's Word. We're in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. I'm going to read just a few verses of Scripture. You can have a seat. I'll unpack the verses for you. We'll move on as we typically do. I'm listening for pages. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. If I don't hear any pages rustling, I presume we're all there. It should be on the overhead, and we can begin. The Word of God says, One day, an expert in the law, in the religious law, stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says in verse 28, you're right. Do this and you will live. Let's pray. Father God, I pray you'd bless the reading of your word this morning, Lord. Would you give me insight and more importantly, Lord, your very words to speak to your people this day. Father, may we apply these words to our life, Lord. May we apply the scripture to our life, Lord, that we'd be changed by it. That we'd walk out of here differently than we came in. Lord, speak to our hearts even now, Lord. Meet with us, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. I got to unpack just a few things. One. Last week when we were together, the scripture, we was in uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 24, and we talked about the 72 messengers that returned after Jesus had sent them out. Do we recall that? Okay, and they were excited because they had power and authority over these demons. They said, even the demons obey us when we use your name. And Jesus said, hey, now, he says, don't rejoice that the demons respond to you. He said, rejoice because your names are written in the book of life. Do you remember that? That was the context in, in which this, this happened. So Jesus is teaching. He sends out 72. 72 come back with a good report. And he comes back and he's teaching them. And when he's done, this is what, this is what picks up. This very next verse. Pull it up for me, Rick. He's teaching and he's talking to them. And then the expert in the law and the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. I'm, this is the NLT translation. The only reason why I'm using it because this is the parallel translation of the chronological Bible that I have. It's the translation that I have. So not that I'm partial to it. So if you have a different translation, read verse 25 for me. Anybody? Anybody else? Thanks, Vern. NIV? NLT, and what translation do you have, Vern? Told me, Christian, that's the hardcore Southern Baptist Bible there. One more. Anybody else? Yowen, what you got? ESV? ESV? Then the Lord said, I can tell you exactly who or what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God. Very good. Did you have a different one here? Go ahead. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Tested him, tempted him. But we see the same thing. The Bible says that this guy was an expert in the religious law. Yours, Aaron, said he was a lawyer, right? An expert in the law, I suppose. But it says one day the expert in the religious law stood up and he, and he tested Jesus. He stood up to ask Jesus a question that he already knew the answer to. He's testing Jesus. Do we do that? Do we test Jesus Christ today? Do we ask him? You know, did, does he really, do we really believe? Do we test what we already know to be true? We can. So I'm, I'm always trying to teach application. How do we apply? So let's take a look. He stands up and he says, what do I do? He asks the question, what must I do to inherit? We have one, two, three, four different translations, and the word inherit was used each and every time. What do we know about an inheritance? It's not earned, is it? It's not. An inheritance is given. Typically, we inherit things after someone else has passed away. Very interesting that he utters something prophetic here. What do I got to do to inherit this eternal life? How does he know he's going to inherit it? He didn't say, how do I earn it? He says, what do I, it's interesting, he says, what do I got to do? Jesus asked him, he said, what should I do? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Interesting question. So Jesus, I love Jesus' style. He always turns the question around. And puts it back on him. 
Here the religious leader, he tells him, Jesus tells him, what does the law of Moses say? Since you're an expert in the law, you tell me, what does the law say? How do you read it? And the man answers, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. I broke down the words, definitions to the word strength, because this is what the leader, this is what the religious leader told Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Heart, the central or the innermost part of something, right in the center, the heart of the city, for example, the center, the middle, the hub, the core. Amen? Right. When the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about the center of the person. Okay, so the Jesus is saying, well, this man is actually quoting the law. He says, you need to love. This is how you inherit eternal life. You want to go to heaven? He says, love God with all of that. Amen? Right. Then he says, all your soul. People confuse the soul and the spirit. Those are two different things. The soul is comprised of the whole. Rhymes with whole and soul. Remember that. The soul is all of you. All of you. So it's the, it's the person's emotion, their intellect, all of that. So you got to love God with all of that. All right? Um, go to the, the, city, the next thing he says, your heart, your soul, and with your strength. What do we know about strength? Strength. I'm going to look for the definition. It says the quality of being made strong in particular. A good or beneficial quality or an attribute of a person. Advantage, asset, forte, aptitude, talent, skill, specialty. What are your strengths? This really doesn't apply. When you're talking about strength, you're talking about power. With everything that you have, all of your strength, we should love God like that. This is a challenge, church. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, I'm good. You're checking it off. I challenge you to ask yourself, do you love God with all your heart? Do you love God with all your soul? Do you love God with all of your strength and with all of your mind? How do you love him with all of your mind? You know, the Bible says to take every thought captive. We should be constantly thinking and, and, and be mindful of the presence of God in our life. I had a brother here in the church who tells me, he said, hey, pastor, he says, I watch these YouTube videos of these phenomenal preachers, one in particular. He says, I watch them throughout the week, and it feeds my soul. Do you love God like that? What do we know about garbage in, garbage out, right? This is a beautiful thing. Jesus said, the man says, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, nothing, just love God. And people, oh, I love God. Do you love him like that? That's the challenge. And then the second part, or he actually finishes the verse, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. I got to caution you here. At first glance, this verse seems that if you do these things, you'll go to heaven. As if heaven's is a works, you can work your way into heaven. But what do we know? We know that Jesus says, the man asks, what do I do to inherit? You can't work your way into heaven, church. You can't work your way into heaven. So what's Jesus talking about when he says, do these things and you'll live? These things are the overflow. They come out of the heart of a person who loves God with all their heart, mind, and soul. These the things just pour out. You, if you're doing these things, the byproduct of your love for God will spew out, spew out like that. And if you're doing those things, then you're... You're probably good. You're going to go to heaven, Jesus said. In another passage, he actually says all of the laws and all of the prophets hinge on these two commandments. Love God and you love your neighbor. Love your neighbor, he says. People say, well, I do love my neighbor. Do you love him like yourself? I love him. I just don't like him, Pastor. Is that possible? I don't hate anybody, per se. I don't hate this dude. He just gets on my doggone nerves. But I love him in the Lord. Do you? This is a challenge, church, because trust me, I know people who rub you the wrong way. They rub me the wrong way. And the Bible says love them. But I don't want to love Donald Trump. And guys like him. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go to the next verse, Rick. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Verse 29. The man wanted to justify his actions. Check this out. Not only was his question, wasn't this, he wants to justify his actions, so he says, he's a Jewish guy. He's a religious leader. He's a teacher of the law. And he asked Jesus a loaded question. What do I got to do to inherit eternal life? 
Jesus tells them, love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, with all that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Most of us love ourselves. We do. Some of you are like, maybe too much, but we all do. <laughs> Some of us not enough. And that's true. But most of us love ourselves, especially more than we love our neighbors. But Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. So the man wants to justify his actions. Translation, anyone read different? Verse 29, a synonym for justify. Anyone? <laughs> well, I know, I know that we uh, rationalize our sin. We do what we do, and we rationalize it. We try to justify it. But if you really honestly hold it up to what the Word of God teaches, you'll know you're wrong. And the Bible clearly is the measuring stick we should be going by. So the man wants to justify his actions, so he asks Jesus, okay, then who's my neighbor? Man, this is something I could see today. If I told somebody, you got to love your neighbor, they would say, okay, no problem. My neighbor's real cool. We have barbecues together. We used to eat ribs with him. We used to listen to salsa music and dance and stuff in the backyard. I mean, we're good. Me and my neighbor are cool. But is that your neighbor? Let's take a look. Jesus is extraordinary. Every time he teaches a point, there's always something deeper to it. Always. Always. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. So this smart guy tells him, okay, who's my neighbor? Jesus says, glad you asked. He says, who's my neighbor? Go to verse 30. <laughs> I'm going to come up here and read from my Bible. This is good. Jesus replied with a story. Stories are, are excellent. They're portable. You could take them with you. He says, the Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. This is important. He's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, two different cities. Amen? Right. Now, as he's traveling, what's happening is you don't understand this because maybe you do, but there's a, there's a, it's just like a valley he's got to walk through to get there. As he's walking, uh, he's Jewish. The Jew is walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. Okay, he's traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. Bandits typically hid out in these valleys and waited for you to come by, and they jump out, pounce you, and take what they wanted. So he says, they, now, let me ask you this. Let's just say this. Let's just say, pretend that this Jew is from Jerusalem, which he probably is. Okay, and he's going to Jericho. Where's his neighbors? They're back there. He's halfway between here and there. And so here's the application, church. We don't stay in our Jerusalems. You don't stay in your house where you and your neighbor eat and barbecue together. You leave there eventually, and you're going to pass people throughout the day. Okay, so he's walking. He falls into the hands of bandits, and they strip him from his clothes, and they beat him, and they left him for dead. They left him half dead beside the road. Verse 31. This is a story Jesus is telling. Remember, these stories have earthly, they're earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Jesus says, by chance, a priest, a descendant from the line of Aaron, walks by. Holy man of God walks by, saw the man lying there, and crossed to the other side. Here he is, keeps walking. <coughs> Probably prayed for him or something, I don't know. But the Bible says he kept on trucking. Next verse. The temple assistant, Levi, descendant of Levi, the tribe of Levi, holy man of God, walks right by, over at him, looks at him laying there, and passes by on the other side. <laughs> They're like, hey, he's bleeding. He have a disease for all we know. I ain't touching him. The truth is, uh, the, the priests and even the Levites could defile themselves by touching so in some aspects, I understand, but they didn't, even, they, didn't even, they didn't even try to help him. Could they have helped him without touching him? Maybe. They didn't even try. They used that, re that I can't touch anything unclean and unpure. I can't. They used that as an excuse to completely disregard the needs of a person who was laying there. The Bible says beaten on the side of the road. The holy man of God, priest, and the temple assistants, the Levites, they passed by on either side. Verse 33, the so-called Christian church. Application, go ahead. Verse 33, then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Now, some of you understand that Samaritans were greatly despised by the Jews. They were half-breed Jews. They were descendants from an intermarried, uh, conquered kingdom. 
The Assyrians conquered uh, Israel, and uh, they conquered the northern kingdom, and then they bred with their, and they had offspring, and these half-breed Jews, they hated them. Racial tension, if you will. Oh, my, the boy, more things change, the more they stay the same. Amen? So we have this religious prejudice or religious bigotry, if you will, and then we have racial one. This Samaritan comes along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Go to the next verse. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. When he put the man on his own donkey, the Samaritan's donkey, and took him over to an inn where he took care of him. Next verse. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, and, I, and if his bills run higher than what I just gave you, I will pay you the next time I'm back. Go to the next verse. Meeting a very real need from a person who can't stand him. From a person who can't stand him. Here's a person who can't stand you, hates your guts because you're a fundamental Christian or because you're Hispanic or because you're a female or because you're black, whatever. They can't stand you. And they're laying there beaten and broken and battered and need help. And you walk by and go, that's what you get. Kick some dirt on his face. That's not what he did, is it? Which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? I've read this passage a bunch of times. I never really noticed this. But here's what I want to point out to you. The religious teacher's response. Look what he says. Go to the next verse. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. You know what's missing? The word Samaritan. He couldn't even get himself to say the word Samaritan. He couldn't acknowledge the fact that this no good half breed, lower life, was the one who deserves the credit for being a neighbor. He couldn't even do it. He, he omitted the very thing that he said in the beginning when you said, love your neighbor. Love is missing. He couldn't even say Samaritan. Jesus said, you go and do the same. Go and do the same. Now, I couldn't get past this, so I looked up the definition for neighbor. The dictionary says a neighbor is a person living near you or next door to the speaker. So I'm the speaker. I say, hey, the person near me or next door is my neighbor. That's true. Amen? But this story kind of spreads it out a little bit further, does it not? What do we see? It's easy to put fences around us. It's easy to, to separate us from them. But Jesus tore those things down. He tore those things down. Let's look at the, per, the, the principles that we can take from this passage. One, lack of love, a lack of love makes it real easy to justify the things that we do even when they're not right. Does that make sense? Even though it's never right, a, a lack of love makes it real easy to do. I don't love this guy, so it's easy to do. What the Bible says, love covers a multitude of sins, does it not? If my kid, my own daughters, make a mistake, do something dumb and, and, and hurt me as their father or my feelings or whatever, it's easy for me to forgive them because I love them to death. <coughs> not so easy when you don't love the person. A lack of love. We say, well, I, like, I love them, I just don't like them. I don't think that's really possible. I mean, maybe it is. But that's not enough, is it? We need to, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what we need to be striving to do. We, I look at this passage and I think of the priest who walks by and I think of the Levite who walks by and I think of how many Christians, how many Christians just deliberately ignore the needs of other people because it's inconvenient. We're busy. Well, guess what? The guy on his way from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho, he was busy too. We're all coming and going. We all got things to do. You don't neglect an opportunity to show somebody compassion. This is, what, this is what the Lord is teaching us. There's your application. Who's the neighbor? The one who showed mercy to me. We walk past people and we won't give them a second thought because we got things to do, places to go, and people to see. 
Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and do like the Samaritan. What else do we learn from this? Another principle we can take. Our neighbor is anyone, regardless of their race, creed, social background, anyone in need. Now, I know what the Bible teaches about homosexuality, okay? I know what it teaches, and people don't like to hear it. But it's true. It doesn't change. We can have conviction without compromise. And show, we can have conviction, show compassion, and not compromise. It is not our job to condemn people. It's not our job. So if you say, okay, it's okay to bash gay people, then it's okay to bash black folks too, or Hispanics or whatever, and pick another religion. It's not. God died for all of them. I'm not saying that the behavior is okay, because it's not the Bible clearly teaches these things, but we don't have any right to be bigots, to put people into categories, and we don't have that right. Our job is to have conviction, Show compassion, yet not compromise. How do you do that? I mean, you think, I mean, this, this guy did a good job of that. He reached out to a person who was needing help. I read this article. It's incredible. He is a professor in a university. He said he's a, uh, he said he's a Republican, conservative, and he is a minority in the university. He said he's treated uh, really, really almost like, a, he said a homosexual would have been treated in Mississippi in the 50s. I was reading it and I was like, wow. So what's happening is people are categorizing Christians as the narrow-minded bigots. That's what's happening. The person who stands on something is intolerant. Here we have a person who, here's the Samaritan, who's completely despised by a group of people. And he didn't hesitate to show him mercy. But I'm telling you, we don't do that, church. When I say we, I mean the evangelical church don't do that. Things are changing a little bit, but they need to change a lot more. Amen? So what are we talking about? I'm talking about being a neighbor, being a neighbor, loving people the way God loves them. And here's another principle we learn. Love means acting to meet a person's needs. We need to act on it. Amen? What do we know here? The religious expert, he looked at the man as a subject to be discussed. The religious expert asked Jesus, he says, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And so this topic for discussion, this person in need is a topic for discussion, according to the religious man. To the, bandit, to the bandits, he is someone to be exploited, somebody to be used, somebody to be taken advantage of. To the religious men, the priests and the Levites, the wounded man was a problem to be avoided. You do that, your phone's ringing, you know who's calling, you know they need something, you won't answer it. To the innkeeper, the man was a customer to be served. And yet to the Samaritan, he was a human being worth being cared for. And to Jesus, all of them, even these narrow-minded people who completely disregarded, all of them were worth dying for. Amen? The Bible says that before we come to know God, we are enemies of God. Now, that, some people don't like that. When I taught that in a Sunday school class, I had a person shook to their core when I said that. The person says, I can't accept that. I said, it's true. The Bible says God is making his plea to mankind through us. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling a world back to himself. What would he need to reconcile us for if our relationship was never severed in the first place? Amen? It's true. Before you know God, before you come to a relationship with God, you're an enemy of God, the Bible teaches. And then when you come into this relationship with God, you become a friend of God. And as the song I sang earlier, I said, what a friend we have in Jesus. We, all the pain we, we, we deal with in our life because we don't take things to him in prayer. Jesus Christ is a friend indeed. He is there for you. Now, I don't know how you feel about the friend who invited you to church today. I don't, I don't know what you really feel. But Jesus Christ is really, really your friend. Go to uh, John 15, Rick. I just read it off the overhead. Jesus, in John 15, he, he tells his disciples that they are, no, they are his friends. He says, this is my commandment. This is Jesus' commandment. He says, a new commandment I give to you. He says, love each other in the same way that I've loved you. Next verse. There is no greater love than this to, for to lay down one's life for his friends. 
Jesus laid down his life for you. If you accept that, the Bible says you become a friend of God. That's the song we sing too, right? I'm a friend of God. He calls me friend, right? Next verse. You are my friends, he says, if you do what I command. Next verse. I no longer call you slaves or servants because a master doesn't confide in his slaves or his servants. <laughs> now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father has told me. James, go to James chapter 2, verse 23. And so it happened just as the scripture says that Abraham believed God, believed that confident reliance and trust in God. He believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Even so, he was called a friend of God. You, be, you want God to be your friend, trust me. You don't want to be on the opposite side of that fence. You don't. But all you really have to do, the scripture says here, Abraham believed God. He trusted God and God counted him righteous. He gave him a friendship. They became friends through this faith. What do you do to inherit eternal life? It's simple, church. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor. I don't care what color he is. I don't care how rich he is, how poor he is, how educated he is, how ignorant he is, how pretty he is, how ugly he is. Fat, short, skinny, tall, it doesn't matter. Black or white, purple or green, it doesn't matter. Amen? God died. He, Jesus came and he died for everybody. That's the truth. And you have a lot of friends. This is, and this is what I've learned. I told the kids in elementary school, there's a lot of people you consider friends. But when it hits the fan, you'll find out who your real friends are. You'll find out who your real friends are. I'm going to finish with this story. Only with the little kids. I don't know. Okay. Um, gangster. I know some of you are very familiar with gangster. As a police officer, I shared this story before. I ran up, I'm a, I'll have to use this illustration for you. It's three, three gangsters in a neighborhood they ain't got no business in. The wrong gang. These three guys go into a neighborhood, they're stealing car stereos. This car drives by, these three guys, wrong neighborhood, yell at these guys. These guys slam on the brakes, jump out the car. These two guys take off running and leave one by himself. The guys in the car, pound them, beat them to a bloody pulp, stab them several times, and throw them off of a bridge. I'm driving in my police car, and they almost crash into me as they're coming over, the guys who ran. They, they crash into my squad car, and they're freaking out, and they're hooting and hollering, help, help me, my friend's over there, he's getting beat up, they're going to kill him. So I put these guys in my car, I run up the bridge, I lock them in there so they don't get away on me. I run up the bridge, and I see the bloody kid running back over, stab, pull a hole, call him an ambulance, try to find out what happened. The ambulance gets him, takes him to the hospital, and I, I, I get all the details, I get all the stories. But these are gangsters who pledge themselves to each other. I mean, there's... There's rules. There's rules. If you don't know gangs, I don't have time to get into all of that. But here's my point. My point is that the hospital talked to the kid. I said, what happened? He gave me the same story. I'm trying to put it all together. I'm looking at him. I said, your friends left you, dude. He goes, I know. And they got one coming for that. I said, you're missing the point. <laughs> if there's any mothers in here, you put a mother on that bridge with her kids, she ain't leaving. Friends sacrifice for each other. Friends love each other through thick and thin. Friends are there for each other. Friends are real friends. And those real friends are hard to find, church. When, they, when it all comes tumbling down, people typically will, will default to self-perseverance. They're going to do what they need to do to save their own hide, which means sacrificing you. That's the truth. I've seen it over and over again in my career. Over and over again. That's just one clear example. Jesus would never do that to you. Never. In fact, he's the one who laid down his life for you. Amen? I'm going to ask the praise team to come forward as I close. I want to ask you something. I want to ask you. You sit here today. I want you to ask you, Is are you a friend of God? Are you a friend of God? Do you have a relationship with him? You know, my father, my biological father, I love my dad. And he lives in Puerto Rico. And our relationship is severed because of the distance between us. But my dad learned how to text. He's on Facebook. So he's kind of closing the gap a little bit. So I'm able to keep in touch with my father. But the thing is, my, the, relationship, the relationship positionally between me and my dad never changes. That's my dad, period. 
Amen? But the fellowship that comes from hanging out with him, talking with him, having coffee with him, watching the Bears lose with him, those things are gone in the absence of that relationship, the building. Are you following me? So maybe you're here today, and you, like me, you say, hey, I am a friend of God. I just haven't had a conversation with him in a long time. I haven't been in church in a long time. Or maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, I, I don't know that I am a friend of God. One way or the other, you can reconcile all that today. Simply, before you leave here, all you have to do, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And your relationship with God, if you don't have one, can start today. That's a beautiful thing. I want to ask you this, this today. I want to ask you this morning. Are you a friend of God? And if you are, then the next question is, what kind of friend are you? We know what kind of friend he is. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Amen?